All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you for those on the Zoom. Uh, I am standing behind the podium, which is why you can't see me, my apologies. I'll just poke out, hello. Um, in the hybrid world we live in. It's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Adam Levine. I am the director here at the Toledo Museum of Art, and we are just so thrilled to have you all here um, for a day of learning about opportunities to best engage the uh, public resources which are being made available uh, to all of us in the cultural sector. Uh, I am not going to take very long, but I do just want to, before introducing Congresswoman Marcy Kaptar, thank her uh, and thank the representatives from the agencies who will be speaking to you today. The Toledo Museum of Art has been the beneficiary this past year of incredible support that has left us in a position of not having had to furlough or lay off any staff. In fact, we are in an incredibly strong position and growing in part because of the Congresswoman's championing of our efforts. Specifically, we were able to get a national endowment for the humanities um, chairman's grant to support the creation of the first ever curator of American art in our 120 year history. So I can tell you do exactly what Tatiana tells you to do today. It's incredibly valuable information, but we could not do it without you, Congresswoman. Um, so with that, I know we got started a few minutes late, but I'm going to turn over the mic for the formal introductory remarks to a woman who needs no introduction, who has been a champion for this region and for the arts and community for decades, uh, please join me in welcoming Congresswoman, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Thank you so very much, Director Levin. You, we are so fortunate that you are here at our really great museum, one of the 10 greatest museums in the entire United States of America uh, here in Toledo, Ohio. So for all those who came before us, dating back to the Libby family, for those who endow now, uh, we've created something for the world and we are very grateful for all of your attendance today and those who are listening uh, by zoom welcome to you as well really thrilled to have you they told me i have to sit down and uh, make my formal introduction so i will i will do that and um, thank everyone here for for joining us i have my mask off because i'm speaking right now but we are very honored this morning to have guests uh, certainly the director of the Toledo Museum of Art, but also panelists, including federal representatives from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, as well as an invaluable partner from the Ohio History Connection, the State Historic Preservation Office. I want to thank Margaret McGinnis of my own staff in Washington. She's come out here and helped put this wonderful program together. There she is artistically dressed uh, this morning. And uh, also David Zavak, who had been here, I'm not quite sure where he is now, uh, from our uh, regional office and thank him as well uh, and all of the interns that he has brought with him. Uh, thank you for your unwavering commitment to the arts and humanities. Uh, that actually make us human if we care to pay attention. All your organizations play a critical role in the preservation and celebration of culture and vibrancy and actually give life and value and value to our communities. The arts and humanities bring so much needed joy and insight on the human condition to people every day. So you're a great learning institution as well. You've been especially important in delivering hope during the isolation and fear that Americans have experienced over these last 18 months. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Ohio's arts and creative industry have suffered from the highest unemployment rate in the state at about 27% uh, calculated in January of this year. That is, uh, in some ways at this particular institution been blunted by astounding leadership. But overall, Ohio's creative business sector has lost more than 80,000 jobs and upwards of $1.8 billion in revenues. We passed federal legislation in order to try to close that gap. And we, one of the reasons for the discussion today is to make sure that all of the assistance that's been made available directly as well as indirectly through the state of Ohio 
can come to aid those who are trying to continue to perform their important work. We're here today because we want to help get your organizations back on track and make sure you have the access to the resources and knowledge needed to apply for federal grants. Through the American Rescue Plan, which Congress passed earlier this spring and President Biden signed into law in March, Ohio Bill will be receiving funding from the agencies present today. And let me give you these numbers. The Endowment for the Humanities provided the state of Ohio over $43.8 million. The question is, who will receive it? The Institute of Museum and Library Services received $4.5 million. And the National Endowment for the Arts, $931,000. It gives me hope that with all of you here today, you will make our communities competitive in this grant process and help secure this funding locally. Lastly, thank you especially again to the Toledo Museum of Art for graciously hosting us today, to Adam, to Cindia, and to Jim, who's handling all the acoustics. Thank you. We are extremely proud of this museum, which is a crown jewel, not just for Toledo, but for America. And a big congratulations to the museum on its recent award of the National Endowment for Humanities Chairman's Grant to create the museum's first ever curator of American art. That's a big bravo, no matter how you look at it. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist from the National Endowment for the Arts, an Ohio native, Wendy Clark, who's sitting here to my right, she kindly took time out of her very busy life to be here. She's the National Endowment of the Arts Director of Museums, Visual Arts, and Indemnity. And we look forward to her remarks. Thank you, Wendy, for being with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur. It's uh, thrilling to meet you. I've been the whole agency has been grateful for your incredible leadership over dozens of years, frankly, for the arts and the NEA and your latest commitment to the American Recovery Plan, um, unbelievable appropriation of $135 million for the NEA to help disseminate. So I'm going to get into that, not too much in the weeds, but I also want to thank the museum and welcome Adam Levine. Great to see you again, the director and um, I loved working with Margaret McGinnis. She was great on your staff. And I'm just really thrilled to be here. I am Ohio native. Um, I also went to Michigan, but um, don't hold that against me. <laughs> so, so the NEA, most of you, I, I, before I start, are how many people are from a performing arts organization? Okay, everyone, most others, visual arts? or museum -y or library, or, yeah. Okay, great. Um, this is, um, you know, we'll, I'll give you a general overview of the NEA. I'll try to um, demystify it a little bit. And let me see if I can get this clicker working. Um, so we're an independent federal agency and we give grants in a, in a variety of disciplines and we also have a lot of special initiatives. Uh, we work a lot with rural communities through the design program. And we have um, some other programs in literature, the Big Read and Blue Star Museums, which offers active duty military free admission for the summer to our nation's museums. And um, let's see. I'm sorry, I can't advance it. Is it, is it me? Um, so anyway, these, so here's a big list, a laundry list of our categories, artists, communities, arts, ed, I won't read them all, but theater, visual arts, opera, local arts agents. And, um, we have grants and special initiatives in each of these. Will it work for me to do it? If I stand here then? Okay. Okay. That might be, I'll, I'll stand right here though, too, because then. I'll just say next. <laughs> so speaking of demystifying, this is the Museum of Visual Arts team. And I just thought I would show you our faces since we've all been remote <coughs> for so long. Next, please. So 
Uh, American Rescue Plan, I mentioned that the latest $135 million appropriation that we are getting out the door um, in a really deliberate way and intentional way. We're trying to um, uh, do a lot of outreach to people who have never applied to the endowment before, organizations, um, of course, with a 501c3 status. Next. So, like I said, we're trying to do it intentionally, distribute relief as quickly as possible, but with a real plan, some will go straight to the states and local arts agencies and then arts organizations. Next. So we are considering equity at every stage. Um, the wider eligibility that we've created, um, you, you don't have to have been a former grantee. We're doing a lot of technical assistance. We're getting a, a bunch of new readers in to evaluate. And we're going to have resources if you're unsuccessful. We're going to have all hands on deck to give you some, you know, pointers for other opportunities at the agency. Next. So this is more, more flexible. We've um, been before and accessible. We've got new materials in Spanish, Chinese, and we'll, we're doing a lot of technical assistance workshops. Next. Um, we're go about halfway down. In fact, there's one right now, Tuesday, August 3rd at 11, um, that we're providing, but there's a few more. And I understand they'll make this slide deck available to you so you can, you don't have to scribble down these dates. Next. So the, we have the American Rescue Plan specifically is eligible for grants to organizations and then local arts agencies. Next. Oh. One more. Yeah, so what's it for? It's for general operating. It's for day-to-day -day business expenses. It's to, it's to help you, you keep the doors open and pay your staff. Next. So you have to be a nonprofit 501c3, and um, you have to have a three-year history of programming before August 12th, 2021. That's sort of standard in, in our other grant category that I'll get to. Next. So, um, you know, we're, we're really looking for all kinds of organizations, not the big guys only. We um, are looking for small and medium-sized budgets, rural and urban. And again, you, could, you can have a first-time grant this time. Next. So there are some, um, this is some limits, of course. Um, and you know, this is sort of case by case, but you do, um, you can also apply for other funding opportunities that call grants for arts projects that I'll talk about in a minute. Next. So the grants are specific. They're, they're either for 50, 100 or 150,000. And matching funds are not required in the American Rescue Plan, which we've been calling ARP or ARP. Um, the other category you do need to match. And you can ask for support of up to two years. So keep that in mind. Next. Salary support. These are all the eligible um, expenses in, in a budget. Stipends for artists, facility costs, mortgage principal, rent utilities, costs association, associated with health and safety supplies, and marketing and promotion. Next. So grants for arts projects, which is our, our, our other major category, is for a variety of things, a variety of projects that support public engagement, creation of excellent artwork, learning in all stages of life, and integrating the arts into the fabric of community life, which um, speaks to also our we are just thrilled that Con trust entrusted us to, to get this American Rescue Plan money out the door and help the, com the country recover in all the ways that we know we have to. There's, between COVID and you know, the other um, civil rights uh, violations and how divided the country is, 
the arts have a unique ability to bring people together. Next. So we incur, we, so yeah, so we sp support specific art projects and we have, you know, grants in every state and US territories. Next. And we encourage applications that originate from or are in collaboration with a variety of institutions, maybe not as um, actively served in the recent past, but we're working closely with HBCUs, the American Indian and Alaska Native Tribes, African American serving institutions, Asian American and Hispanic, and organizations that, that support independence and lifelong inclusion of people with disabilities. Next. So similar to the ARP grants, an organization does have to be tax exempt, 501c3, three-year history of arts programming. Next. So for grants for arts projects, um, we don't fund individuals. Um, and in this category, it's not for general operating. It is for projects that, um, you know, are, are designed for a variety of um, activities. That's fine. In the visual arts, we support a variety of uh, public art, exhibitions, classes, workshops for kids, and of course, in all the performing arts, we support a lot of um, special efforts to train you know, new choreographers or um, provide places for artists to work. There's a lot of residency programs in the country that um, we have supported over the years. Next, <laughs> thanks. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and next, that's a detail. Um, so the review criteria, artistic excellence and artistic merit. And by excellence, we really mean the quality of the artists, the artwork, the providers of the services that the project will involve. And uh, the artistic merit is really more about the appropriateness of a project to an organization's mission or audience and their ability to carry it out. How appropriate is the budget? How clear are the project activities? Do, you know, are you, are you reaching too high or, you know, are you being realistic and showing us that you can achieve what you're trying to achieve? Next. So the deadlines for that category are February and July. So um, when we just had a deadline a couple weeks ago for Grants for Arts projects. So, the ARP deadline is um, the one you want to focus on. Next. So this is just a screenshot to give you a sense of how to navigate our website. So you go to grants, next. And then grants for organizations, next. And grants for arts projects, next. And then a description of the program, next. And then the contact information, and then you're, you select your discipline here, visual arts, museum, literature, theater, et cetera. Next. Yeah, there's a drop down menu. So I just have a next few shots that I took myself in some of my travels, but these are just, you know, the, the breadth of the work that the country is presenting to the public. Next. Felix Gonzalez Torres there on the left and Kara Walker on the right. Next. Next. So what else does the NEA do besides give grants? We have a lot of initiatives. I mentioned a, a couple at the top of the meeting. One that I'm involved in is Blue Star Museums and we partner with Blue Star Families, which is a, a organization designed to help families of those actively deployed in a variety of ways. And this is just one program that they work on with us. And the Defense Department also helps us with Facebook Live events. And this gives free admission to active duty military and their family members all summer long to uh, museums across the country. And um, in 
pre-COVID years, we always had it. We had about 2,000 museums participate. Last year, we, we put it on hold and last summer, understandably. And this summer, it's active again. And we're up to, um, I think, 1,268 museums this year. So we're, we're pretty pleased with that, given all that's going on. Next. So here are a few of our other efforts. Creative Forces works with creative arts therapy for um, active duty members and veterans who have returned and um, face one or two or many challenges, both you know, physically and mentally. And the Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge, which is a relatively new event, I think probably in our third year, and it's a national competition for students who have a passion for writing songs that could be part of a musical theater production. And then the NEA Big Read is a program across the country and we give grants to support a variety of community reading programs. A very good way to bring a community together. So here are how you contact us. Next. For the American Rescue Plan, um, if your organization is A through L, you know, there's, there's a, an email there. And again, you'll get access to this slide deck. Next. We encourage you to stay in touch with us and you can sign up for our arts endowment newsletters. That, um, and we also would love to have you consider being a panelist for us or recommending people you know who would be good panelists. Um, for me, that would be someone with an interest in visual arts or museums, um, whether or not they, you know, we're always looking for lay people as well. We have a one lay person on every panel. So if you um, know people that you think would be suitable and be interested, please reach out to us. It's, um, it's a lot of work, but I think it's really interesting for people to see what's happening all across the country. And it's modest compensation, but it's uh, $300 for the reading and then $200 for the actual panel participation. Next. So we read the guidelines and instructions. You've got to register with grants.gov and this and what we call SAM, which is Systems Administration Management. So um, those are essential and for any federal, federal support. Make sure you review the review criteria and um, appropriate work samples. That applies to the project grants, not so much for the American Recovery Plan. We don't require work samples. Um, yeah. And start early but make sure to reach out to us. Next. So, okay, so here's the team again and next. And now, you know, just like everyone else, we are, we're on Zoom. So um, we, the endowment has managed to continue to really get all of our work done and, you know, keep trying always to keep our spirits up and make connections. Um, so, we do that in a variety of ways, but we are looking forward to being together again. Next. <clears throat> um, we're gonna do Q&A after all the speakers, is that right? Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for bringing it. You know, as you were talking, I'm thinking, how do we simplify this for those who want to apply? And so I was thinking about, if you're Hungarian-American, you know about something called a Dobosh tort. A dobosh tort is this multi-layered, delicious dessert, and it has a lot of layers to it. And part of the problem with the federal government, it has too many layers. And uh, so people get lost in the mix. And um, so what I want to explain or attempt to explain, Wendy was talking about special funds that come through the American Rescue Act, which is one of many ways that Congress tries to return tax dollars back to local communities. And she said, um, you know, we welcome 501c3 applicants, and that is correct. That is what their guidelines provide. But coming from this part of Ohio and this part of America, we also have to grow the economy. And as one artist from Chester, Pennsylvania said to me, what America makes, makes America. 
And whether you make music or you make art or you make bread or whatever your particular art is, uh, we also have to think about organizations that exist to help you beyond our local organizations. And some of those include our Small Business Administration over in Cleveland, Ohio. Have any of, the, um, of those who are attending around the table here ever used the Small Business Administration in Cleveland? Raise your hand if you have. Uh, oh, that's very interesting. And uh, I wanna just make you aware of it because it's federally funded. Gil Goldberg is currently the director, but it's just a good place to touch base with, to look at their website. Uh, if you also have to earn money and uh, you have products that you want to sell and maybe on a profit-making basis, just not for profit. So I'm hearing Wendy, uh, her particular interest is in not-for-profit organizations, according to the American Rescue Plan and the presentation you've just made. But between Cleveland and Toledo, we have 10,000 artists. Uh, we, have, we have the Sandusky Theater. We have the Beck Arts Gallery uh, in Lakewood obviously the Cleveland Museum, the Toledo Museum, and the Oberlin Museum. And in between, and absolutely unbelievable, I'm finding these artists everywhere. I'm finding them in lofts, you know, near the waterfront. And, and uh, so we just have a rich arts community, but one need that I see, and I just thought I'd throw this in, we have to link our arts community across the coast, and we have to create a brand for it. Um, if I had to do a calendar of this part of America, I would have a Bloomin' Arts Coast calendar because we have beautiful environment, beautiful, best metro parks in the country right here. And uh, the most fresh water any place else, you know, any place else on earth. And then we have this thriving arts community, which is really hidden. It's hidden as hard as everyone tries. We don't have a common image. So, uh, and we don't have a way of, um, of expressing that. And I'm hoping that the two museums will help us in this along with all of the stakeholders in between. But really we are such a uh, astounding place on this earth. And, um, but we don't advertise a few years back and I'll make this real quick. We uh, have these um, individuals like the um, uh, Lake Erie Shores and Islands got some feedback here. Lake Erie, well, those are birds, I guess. I'm going to talk about geese in a second here. Uh, but uh, we have lots of birds and we have places in between that are trying to make money so people can live there and have a good way of life. So they decided that they wanted to present the coast and they created um, Lake Erie Shores and Islands. And we decided to focus on birding. That has become a phenomenal event at Mother's Day every year really now hundreds of thousands of people come uh, and you can just see the coast transforming with studios, with businesses that expand, uh, with photography. I mean, people who live here, you can shake your head. You know, all the marinas are stock full. We've had to help build docks in different places along the lake. So we see the arts community beginning um, to link to the nature community uh, as we look at the artistry that is coming from this marriage. Uh, but again, we don't have an image yet. So maybe somebody that's listening on this today can think about this and put our communicators together and help us to develop an image as the most southern coast of the Great Lakes, the warmest coast where we have this blooming arts community. So I just thought I would throw that in and to say that Gil Goldberg at the Small Business Administration also has, isn't uh, afraid to have people make money uh, and... Um, help arts organizations, among others, to thrive. Um, I also uh, wanted to mention that uh, what I found with artists in my career is that they do not protect their patents and trademarks. And I wanna thank the Toledo Arts Commission for helping to help our artists to appreciate the value of what they are doing. We couldn't do enough education on their legal rights and how to protect their designs and their artistry if they are you know, involved in music or whatever. Um, and so we need a little bit more help on that so people can, I could tell you a lot of stories, but so that people can fully realize the value of what they are doing. The other thing I wanted to say going back to the Dobosch tort 
is that the um, Wendy talked a lot about the current money through the rescue plan, but that doesn't account for other funding that is present at all of these arts and humanities agencies. The regular funding that is being provided for this fiscal year of 21 and legislation we are about to pass for the fiscal year of 2022. And so um, Margaret McGinnis and David Zavek are here from our office. We're here to help you weed through all that. There are different layers. So what you're hearing today is only a piece of what is available at the federal level. And we have to gain a comfort level uh, at working with these more complex funding systems, all right, so that you are uh, as well connected as people who live in the greater Washington, D.C. area are, all right? And um, I, I wanted to uh, mention that. So um, in addition to the layers at our, that are federal, some of that money's come right back here to Ohio. Uh, Wendy mentioned the money that came to the state of Ohio, and I went through the amounts of funding from the rescue plan. But the city of Toledo received $180 million from the federal government, and they have not expended those dollars yet, and they shouldn't until they figure out how best to use them. And the mayor and the city council will have to figure out what are the worthy efforts in our area that we want to enhance. The county of Lucas received about 80 million, all right? So the, uh, just in this county, I'm not covering all the counties I represent because I don't want to speak too long, but I'm just making you aware that this cake has a lot of layers that relate to the federal government because we're trying to pull America back, pull her forward, uh, as we grow the economy here, and the arts have to play a central role. So, all right, um, the arts and humanities are very important to us, and so I will now turn to Tatiana Osema, who is the Senior Program Officer in the Division of Challenge Grants at the National Endowment for the Humanities. And Tatiana, we thank you so very much for joining us. I hope you can hear us here in Ohio, and uh, we uh, anxiously await your presentation. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to trust that you all can hear me and see the slides that are there. But um, if not, I hope someone in the room will um, let me know so that I can either slow down or speed up or um, share my screen. Oh, good. I got a thumbs up. So that's great. Um, so thank you so much um, for inviting us at the agency NEH to participate in this. I wish that I could be there in person and, um, and not so much in this hybrid mode, but um, I, I, my thoughts are, are there in the room with you. And um, I, I really appreciate being part of this today. Um, and I couldn't have asked for a better transition into what um, I'm going to be talking about in terms of NEH's um, grant making because um, while Wendy talked a lot about American Rescue Plan, um, NEH has already our deadline for our American Rescue Plan funding um, has passed. We're in the process of, of reviewing and making recommendations. Um, Ohio Humanities also received funding through NEH and through um, that legislation. Their deadline has also passed. So I'm going to be focusing on um, exactly what uh, Representative Kepter said. Our, our baseline regular programs, our regular operations at NEH um, that you can apply for at, at any point. Um, so this is one of those layers um, that, that you're just talking about. Um, so uh, thank you also for that introduction. Um, as uh, mentioned, my name is Tatiana Ausima. I'm a senior program officer in the Office of Challenge Programs. Um, and I'm going to try to keep my remarks to about 10 minutes. It might be a, a little bit longer, um, but I'm going to give a brief overview of the work of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I think you'll be hearing some parallels between what Wendy mentioned for NEA and potentially um, what will be coming up from IMLS. There's a lot of similarities in our work and our processes. Um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with some tips for applying to NEH, but also um, that will likely apply to, to any of the, um, the agencies. So next slide. Let's see, can we get to the next slide? Ah, there we go. 
Perfect. Um, so the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities were created by Congress in 1965. And this is just a quote from our founding legislation describing how both endowments serve the public good. Um, any age supports the work that engages scholars and the public in humanistic inquiry, um, believing that understanding our world today requires history, literature, philosophy, and all of these humanistic fields. Uh, so any <clears throat> age's grants seek to explore the human endeavor and support scholars, students, and the general public in an exploration of what it means to be human and community and lifelong learning. Um, and NEH is one of the largest funders of humanities projects in the United States. Next slide. And so that begs the question of what are the humanities? Um, the arts are generally um, easy to understand, but the humanities start to get a little bit mushy. Um, so our 1965 legislation um, defines the humanities as language and linguistics, archaeology, ethics and law, history, art history, philosophy and religion. Um, we don't support direct art projects. Um, that's where you're going to go to uh, the other endowment, National Endowment for the Arts, and we also don't support um, the humanitarian efforts. There's often a bit of confusion there. Um, we do include some social sciences if they are using and answering humanistic questions um, through humanistic methods. And I like to say that you, know, you put history in front of anything and you're in the humanities. So if you're talking about the history of art, the history of science, that's squarely within the work um, and what NEH funds. Next slide. So for eligibility, um, it, as with any A, um, institutional eligibility is restricted to nonprofits with 501c3 status. Um, and that's, that's very important um, to have that 501c3 status um, to apply to NEH. Um, or you need to be a state, local, or tribal government. Um, so governments and government entities can apply without having that 501c3 status. Um, institutions also must be, um, the primary applicant must be a U.S. institution. Um, the, you, there may be sub-awards um, and subcontracts that may potentially not be U.S. institutions, but it needs to be based in, in the United States since we are uh, spending taxpayer dollars on these projects. Our division of research supports individuals. Um, uh, most of our grants go to institutions, but there are some that um, are individual. And so you'll hear me say repeatedly, check the notice of funding opportunity, reach out to program officers, um, but for in, to, to determine which programs individuals can apply for, um, but they need to be institutionally affiliated or independent, depending on the program. Um, and as long as you have a three-year residence, it could be citizens or non-citizens applying for the individual projects. Next slide. So NEH is organized into seven divisions and offices, as you can see here. And collectively, these offices run over 40 grant programs. Um, they change a little bit each year. They have various deadlines, funding amounts, and programmatic focuses. So in this presentation, I'm gonna introduce you to the general work of each division, but we'll direct you to the website or a program officer for specific grant lines and activities because we would be here all day going through all 40 plus programs that we have running right now. Next slide. So this is just an overview of the seven divisions and their focus. Um, so they aim to facilitate research and original scholarship, strengthen teaching and learning in the humanities, provide public programming in the humanities, preserve and provide access to cultural resources, support the states through our state humanities councils, and to strengthen the institutional base of the humanities. Um, so between these seven divisions, we try to cover all of the activities that you may, um, you, you might do in a humanities organization. 
So one thing that I want to stress is that we're here to help. Um, and you can reach out to me. You'll have my contact information in the slide deck. Um, and you can also reach out through our Office of Congressional Affairs. So the first division I'd like to talk about is the Office of Challenge Programs. That's where I am based um, and where, where much of my work focuses. Challenge Programs is the only division at NEH that requires matching or in-kind contributions. All of our other grant programs are outright funds and you are not required to fundraise or provide um, any kind of in-kind um, or cost share. Challenge Programs focus on buildings, construction, capital campaigns, and successful applicants are awarded matching funds that are intended to stimulate private, state, and local support for humanities infrastructure. So recipients, they're, they're two-pronged grants where recipients must raise cash contributions from non-federal third parties and have them certified by NEH before the matching funds are released. And then the other prong of challenge programs is the construction. Um, so it's often purchasing buildings, restoring buildings, expanding buildings, um, and there is a digital infrastructure aspect of challenge programs as well. Next slide. So the next office is the Office of Digital Humanities. And you might want to look at the Office of Digital Humanities for grant programs that fund project teams experimenting with digital technologies to develop new methodologies for humanities research, teaching, and learning, public engagement, scholarly communications. Um, ODH will fund individual organizations studying digital culture, um, as well as these tools, and humanists seeking to create digital publications. Another major goal of the Office of Digital Humanities is to increase the capacity of the humanities in applying digital methods. So if you're trying to create something new, think about new ways to work with data, reach out to the Office of Digital Humanities um, and see what they, they have to offer there. Um, some funded projects um, will identify audiences, address issues of accessibility and usability, and they should be open, repli replicable, and sustainable. Um, all projects funded in this division analyze workflows and publish their results in white papers that are available on our website. So you can see some of the projects that have been funded through this division there. Next slide. The next division is education. Our Division of Education program supports humanities education through programs that are aimed primarily at program and curriculum development and through professional development opportunities for K through 12 and higher education faculty. So if you are attending this webinar from a, um, you're a teacher or a professor from a university, you might want to look at the Division of Education. Um, these programs have intensive reading and discussion featuring recognized scholars and bring together small communities of teachers at both the higher education and K through 12 levels to investigate new themes and innovative approaches to humanities subjects. Largely residential and held during the summer, these programs encourage the study of common texts and other resources and include visits to collections in libraries and museums and help faculty integrate what has been learned back into their classrooms. So they have a number of um, programs that support broad institutional endeavors um, and then also community colleges, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities. Oh, speaking. So the tribal colleges and universities, um, also there's special encouragements for those and special programs. Um, so if you're from one of those uh, designated organizations, um, there's special programs specifically focused on those institutions. Next slide. So the next office is the, oh yeah, the Office of Fed State Partnerships. 
Um, and I think I saw someone on the line from Ohio Humanities. It, the state and jurisdictional humanities councils are the public humanities in action. Um, you know, where we don't have any regional offices at NEH, we really rely on our, our state partners um, to know what's happening in the community, to work in the community, and they do an amazing job. Um, councils offer a wide array of thought-provoking programming that makes rich humanities ideas accessible for the general public, fosters discussion, and promotes civic engagement. The work that these councils do is tailored to the resources, demographics, interests, and concerns of their state or jurisdictions. They sponsor book festivals, literacy campaigns, speakers bureaus, teacher development, um, and a whole, whole range of publications, films, and exhibitions. Um, so please do uh, keep book, bookmark Ohio Humanities, um, get to know the staff there. They, they do great programming. They also do re-granting um, both through our regular appropriated funds for NEH, but then also these special appropriations such as the American Rescue Plan. Um, and I know that Ohio Humanities is in the process of reviewing applications um, to their American Rescue Plan um, programs as we speak, I believe. Next slide. So the next division is the Division of Preservation and Access. So if you have a project that's dealing with stuff, with things, um, with museum artifacts, with libraries, with manuscripts, um, this is the division that you're gonna want to look at and explore their grant programs. Um, so they support repositories, um, libraries, archives, museums, uh, and the preservation and access, making available all of these collections. And it's a huge challenge to preserve diverse formats of materials that are threatened by just their inherent physical structure um, or by the environments in which they're housed and to create the intellectual control to enable users to find and use the materials relevant to them. So as these humanities collections are being used to create web-based resources that are supported in other divisions such as digital humanities or public programs, um, the Division of Preservation and Access will support the preservation of those materials, um, but then also the ability to make them available through cataloging or um, web-based non-interpretive resources. Um, so the other thing that you may come to Preservation and Access for would be basic digitization. If you want to create a web resource that's, that if you need to digitize materials, Preservation and Access would be your your home. Um, if you're looking to interpret those, it might be public programs or Office of Digital Humanities. And this is where reaching out to a program officer is so helpful. We work collaboratively um, and we're able to, to help direct your project, particularly digital projects, to, to the right division because we, we know it's very, very confusing. There's a lot of different um, avenues that uh, particularly digital projects can take. Next slide. Oh, can we go to public? Yeah, there we go. So public programs um, also supports digital projects, uh, but they also support museum exhibits, community engagement projects, media, and digital projects. Public humanities enable millions of Americans to explore significant works, ideas, and events. They offer new insights into familiar subjects and invite reflection upon important questions about human life. Public programs supports a wide range of public humanities programming that would reach large and diverse audiences and make use of a variety of formats. So it could be interpretation at historic sites, television and radio productions, museum exhibitions, podcasts, short videos, digital games, websites, and all sorts of platforms that probably haven't even been invented yet. Um, so they're gonna use existing platforms um, in public programs. If you wanna develop a new platform, that would be digital humanities. Um, some examples of public programs are gonna be the, the key NEH um, highlights that you've probably seen on our website or heard about. Um, Ken Burns' Civil War documentary, um, the Walters Art Museum exhibition, The Book of Kings, uh, which gave visitors insights into the role of religion in the Middle Ages, and the reinterpretation of historic Hudson Valley's Phillipsburg Manor, which is an 18th century New York mill site 
um, that where visitors learn about the contributions of enslaved African Americans in the North. And my, my favorite is Walden a Game, which is a free to educators digital game that allows players to spend a year at Walden Pond as Henry David Thoreau, uh, which is a, a very a fun game um, to, to explore. So the final division that I'd like to talk about is our division of research. The division of research supports scholarly research that advances knowledge and understanding of the humanities. This division has 12 annual funding opportunities, and this is the division that would support independent scholars. Individuals, teams, and institutions um, are eligible, um, but a lot of people come to research for individual um, grants. And they would be recipients work on research projects of significance to specific humanities fields and to the humanities as a whole. The projects that division supports are as diverse as America, um, editions of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the history of the Star Spangled Banner, and autobiographies of Mark Twain have all been funded in the past year. So if you hear somebody, particularly in academia, say that they got an NEH, they're usually referring to research's longstanding fellowships program. Um, fellowships has been in existence for about 50 years. And since then, approximately 7,000 books have been written by NEH fellows. Um, there's also awards for faculty, summer stipends, and public scholars that are all individual awards um, and grants within the Division of Research Programs. So could I have the next slide, please? So I've, I've gone through a very quick romp through our seven divisions. And so now you're probably wondering, well, how do I figure out both which division to apply to and which grant programs um, are within each project or within each uh, division. So like Wendy, we have a website that has um, all kinds of information about our deadlines um, and our various grants. So when you go to our website, you can click grants in the upper corner. That's gonna give you application information. Um, we also have a tool to match your idea to an NEH grant program. And then there's also an awards database. Um, and if I could have the next slide. So this is fairly small, but I did a, a quick search for um, the ninth congressional district in Ohio to see um, recent awards. And the first one that comes up is the one that um, Adam mentioned, which is the chairman's award uh, for the, uh, the American art curator. Uh, but there's a number of, of projects. So if you'd like to search to find local um, projects. You can search by congressional district. You can search by type of institution. You can search by um, keyword. Uh, and this is a great way to find out, you know, what, what are other people doing? How does my idea fit with other things that are funded? Um, and potentially connect with collaborators in your area. Um, so once you have kind of looked to see what's been funded, you've explored the website a little bit. Um, let's go to the next slide. Then you can look at the landing page for each grant. So every grant program has a landing page that looks like this. It will have a wealth of information and resources. Um, the key things to know are the deadline um, and then also the expected notification date and project start date. You'll see that our review process is very lengthy um, and it's important to make sure that um, the notification deadline and the application deadline all fits with the, the timeline for your project. Um, this landing page also has contact information for each division um, and sometimes specifically for each program. Please make use of that contact information. We love it when you reach out to us with project ideas. We'll help you figure out if it's the right grant program for you. Um, so please use that, inf that contact information, send us an email um, and a program officer will, will get back to you and answer questions. Um, can I have the next slide, please? On this landing page, you'll also find a lot of resources um, for each program. You'll find the notice of funding opportunity or guidelines um, for each program. 
if the deadline has passed, they're also still available. Um, you can check with the, the program to find out if they anticipate any changes before the next deadline. Uh, but go ahead and spend some time with those guidelines, with the NOFO, um, to learn more about the program. You'll find sample budgets and budget forms. You'll find instructions for filling them out. Frequently asked questions. Um, if you want to search specifically for funded grants in a particular program, there's a link for that. Um, and then also sample narratives um, to help you get a sense of, of how other organizations have um, structured their projects. But please don't try to make your project fit into um, a sample narrative they're just there to kind of give you a sense of the level of detail. So in, in my last minute or two, just a couple tips uh, that I think are going to echo uh, very much what, what uh, Wendy said. Um, it's never too early to start planning an NEH application. Um, most of these programs, they're, they're not proposals that you can put together in a couple days. Um, so reach out, as soon as you have an idea, reach out. Um, start researching the different programs and, and start thinking about this early. Make sure you're applying to the right program. Um, spend some time reading the notice of funding or uh, notice of funding opportunity, um, searching for recently funded projects, and make sure that you're spending your time wisely applying to the right program. Registering grants.gov. Um, grants.gov is the only way that NEH can accept applications. Check to ensure that your registration is up to date or start the process um, if your organization is not registered. It can take a number of weeks um, to get registered and we don't have another way to allow you to apply if your registration is not active. Um, spend some time learning how to upload the files and then seek support either from NEH or grants.gov if you run into any technical challenges. Um, but it's, it's definitely worth spending some time in there, becoming familiar with it well, well, well in advance of the deadline. If you are fortunate enough to have an office of sponsored research or a grant officer, it's also incredibly important to start the conversation with them early in the process of preparing your grant application. Um, institutional grants officers often have experience with NEH or other federal grants that will be helpful. Um, and your institution also may have internal policies to follow, such as submitting uh, the application for a review a number of weeks before the deadline. Um, and so make sure you know what your requirements are. Um, and then, you know, as I've said repeatedly, please reach out to a program officer. We can help you at any stage of the process from just discussing ideas to reading and commenting on draft proposals. Not all programs will accept draft proposals, but many do. Um, so plan that into your timeline as well. And then finally, the review process is lengthy, but if you do apply, um, regardless of if you're funded or not, request comments um, from your panelists. Our panelists write really robust comments um, that are often very helpful, whether your project is funded or not, to help um, refine your project, think about things differently, prepare a resubmission if it wasn't recommended for funding, uh, but you do have to request those comments. So um, always, always reach out for, for panelists' comments. Next slide. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you may have in the Q&A. Um, you can reach me directly at the email address above. Um, you can also reach out via our Office of Congressional Affairs um, and they will direct a question um, to the appropriate program officer if necessary. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to answering some questions in a little while. Tatiana, thank you so very much on behalf of the National Endowment for Humanities. I'm going to ask you a question, but will not expect the answer until after I make a brief statement. Uh, and that is, what is your total budget this year uh, for fiscal and uh, what are you projecting for or requesting for fiscal 22? Um, and uh, uh, at the national level, uh, separate from the rescue plan, we've already talked a little bit about how many, how much funding will come to Ohio, uh, 43.8 million out of the rescue funds. 
uh, but I am um, interested in uh, the total amount for 21 and 22, just to give the uh, significant um, viewing audience here a sense of that. But I wanted to say a personal comment. I think that for the arts and humanities right now in our country, together we have a tremendous responsibility to help heal divisions, the divisions in the country, and to help make some sense of the disruptive technologies and disruptive events that are occurring that are politically, um, and I don't mean in a partisan sense, but politically destabilizing the country. And um, that means history and a reflection on our place in the world where we live and helping people make sense of it uh, is extremely important in my opinion. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the history of the settlement of the United States and uh, our own heritage as Ohio. So many schools have cut back teaching history in some relevant way uh, because of cutbacks in the past. But if we think about, in just take Toledo, where we have a great library system and they have a welcome Toledo program where immigrants feel welcome. It is not highly developed, but there's a shell of something there that's important. If I think about Cleveland, the eastern end of our district, the cultural gardens in Cleveland have no match anywhere in the world. I've tried to say this, they take it for granted what they've done. They've created cultural gardens for every ethnic and racial group uh, that has lived in that community and contribute to its settlement. They don't make much of it. Um, I don't know why that is. I was astounded. It doesn't exist at the UN. It doesn't exist in any country that I've traveled in. Northern Ohio really has a story. And um, if we look at the book that David McCullough just wrote about pioneers, the settlement of Ohio itself, all right, um, we settled at the Ohio River through part of the state. But then the North, we actually came through um, two ways. One, the Underground Railroad, but number two, uh, through Ellis Island. And so we receive people from all over the world. Ohio is a very complex state. I think we have something to mention. I don't think we're late. I don't know what's wrong with this microphone, but I'm trying to use it properly. Um, um, the Cuyahoga River was the western boundary of the colonies. And so our part of America, the Northwest Frontier, uh, was actually um, the, um, the new America being born, all right? The Department of Interior doesn't cover it. We have one of the smallest little teeny weeny parks uh, over on the lakefront that I represent. But if you look at what the Department of Interior does in interpretation, and I know we're not talking about the Department of Interior here, however, uh, our part of America is missing. The Cuyahoga National uh, uh, Recreation Area is one of the 10 most visited park systems in the country, but we don't deal with the history of settlement here. So I have a bill called the um, America's First Frontier of the Northwest Territory, trying to bring forward this part of the United States, which is ignored. Again, the power is on the coasts, right? Um, we don't get a lot of play here in our part of the country. We have a tremendous responsibility, in my opinion, for example, just in terms of Native Americans, we have Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. We have Cuyahoga County, Erie County, Ottawa County, the Maumee River, the largest river that flows into the Great Lakes. Is that even interpreted at the national level? No. Um, there's something really missing here. And so I just point that out to you as somewhat of a backdrop as we struggle as a country to define ourselves and appreciate our diversity. Think about what we don't do. Right? We brought in some federal money years ago uh, to um, uh, enshrine the last stop on the Underground Railroad over in Lorraine County. So, uh, fine. But we still, from the museum down in Cincinnati uh, that deals with the Underground Railroad, we don't move interpretation up here. There's plenty of work to be done, in my opinion, in the arts and the humanities, in trying to bring forward and help our people better understand what America really is, right? So I just wanted to put that as a backdrop. Some of the work that you all do is contributing to this, but we can do so much better as a country and help everyone feel welcome, everyone. And that's gonna take 
all of us pulling forward together. So I wanted to put that on the record. Also, I wanted to say to Sandra from the Institute of Museum and Library Science and to Andy Verhoff, uh, who's here, and we'll be talking about the state uh, uh, office and the Ohio History Fund. Uh, we have till about one o'clock and get questions answered. I think that the system that we provide for people to uh, send us questions, uh, send them to Margaret McGinnis or um, to David Zavek on my office staff if we don't get every question in. But um, I wanted to make people feel comfortable that what they're thinking and asking is important and we will answer those questions for you. So Sandra, um, you are the Senior Grants Officer and Management Specialist and the Team Lead at the Office of Grants Policy and Management at the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. We welcome you. Uh, your acronym is IMLS and we welcome your presentation. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me? I hope people can hear me. Um, I will be a disembodied voice because my um, my audio decided to go out right before this meeting. So I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I will be running through a lot of information in the next hopefully 10 to 12 minutes um, about IMLS. <clears throat> and I do look forward to um, answering any questions that you might have. Um, once again, hello, my name is Sandra Narva, and I am delighted to join you today in representing IMLS. And on behalf of the agency's leadership and staff, I would like to thank Representative Kaptur for the invitation to participate and all of her staff, particularly Margaret McGinnis, for making it easy for us to participate. Um, I want, today, I'm going to give you a quick overview of our funding programs with the hopes that you'll see something there that piques your interest. Um, once again, I, I will not be talking about the American Rescue Plan. Um, those applications have been due. They are being reviewed right now, and we will be making our funding decisions very soon. But what I will be doing is talking about eligibility, providing <clears throat> hints and tips, and point you to several important resources designed to help you put together a good proposal. And then we'll look over the peer review process and close out with uh, some best advice offered by IMLS staff reviewers and successful applicants. Once again, um, I will do this as quickly as possible. A little bit of background for I about IMLS if you're not familiar with us. <clears throat> we are an independent federal grant making agency. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the primary source of federal support for the nation's libraries and museums. We're here to help ensure that all Americans have access to museums, library, and information services. We provide institutions rather than disciplines is one thing that distinguishes us from our sister agencies, NEA and NEH. And by doing this, our funding supports the arts, humanities, and sciences of all types. In addition to making grants, we also convene groups, we conduct research, and we publish, all in order to build the capacities of museums and libraries to better serve their public. INLS is led by a director who is presidentially appointed and confirmed by the Senate, and we are advised by a National Museum and Library Services Board. So on this slide, you can see a snapshot of our current federal funding. Um, on the top, you will see the American Rescue plan funds for FY21, and below that is our quote-unquote normal funding and our budget. 93% of our normal budget is designated for grant making, and 7% goes to administration, research, and evaluation. Our, my focus today will be largely talking about our discretionary grant programs, and those are the ones that you will most likely be interested in applying. Next slide, please. Great. So before I talk about the discretionary programs, it's also important to know that our um, that over 70% of our normal budget is distributed to states and territories through our grants to state library administrative agencies program. With this, each state gets an allotment based upon population. This year, 5.26 million is coming to Ohio through our quote unquote normal budget with an additional 
$4.54 million in America, American Rescue Plan Act funding for a total of $9.8 million. And for specific details on the program and highlights of their five-year plan and sub-award opportunities for Ohio, please visit the state profile on our website. Um, and all of this is due to the amazing work by the State Library of Ohio. Um, and all of the contact information is located on this slide. Okay, next slide, please. So who can apply for our funding? Um, generally, it's a nonprofit museum and library that are located in the United States, the territories and freely associated states. Federally recognized tribes and nonprofit organizations that primarily serve native Hawaiians are eligible for certain programs as are colleges, universities, and associations that support um, the work of museums and libraries, as well as HBCUs and um, whose missions are focused on African American history and culture. There are additional requirements related to the number of days open and staffing. And so it's really important for you to explore and understand the eligibility requirements for each of our grant programs before you apply. Those that are not eligible to, um, to apply are for-profit organizations, individuals, we do not give grants to individuals, federally funded institutions, and foreign countries or organizations. Okay, next slide, please. So when we talk about museum, um, museum includes a variety of organizational types that you may not think of as being a museum, and libraries come in many forms too. And so they are listed on this slide. It's quite a broad array. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna to come to our discretionary library uh, funding programs. So once again, I'll be giving you a blisteringly fast overview of each program. And I encourage you to go and visit our website for the details about any of these programs. Okay, next slide. We have two large library programs designed for different purposes. Our national leadership grants for libraries typically take on big problems whose resolution will have a wide impact um, and raging benefits and utility. There are four funding categories and they differ in project focus and in dollar amount. We also offer the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program that supports the development of a diverse workforce of librarians and archivists. Like the National Leadership Grants, there are several project categories, each with their own focus, dollar amount, and cost share amount. What's important to know about these library programs is that there is a two-step application process. There's a two-step preliminary proposals that are due in the fall, and a subset of those applications are then invited um, to come back and submit full proposals in the spring. Funding for these programs can go up as much as a million dollars per award, depending upon the project category, and these projects can extend from one to three years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we also offer funding through the Native American Library Services. Our basic grant program is designed to improve library services to facilitate the um, adoption of new and emerging technologies that benefit tribal communities. And our enhancement grants uh, program supports activities that are to emphasize digital services, educational programming, and pre, um, a preservation and revitalization. Um, the grants for enhancements range up to $150,000, and there are no cost share requirements for these projects. We also do offer a Native Hawaiian Library Services Program, which is structured very much like our Native American Library Services. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna turn our attention to our museum funding programs. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that all of our museum programs have a deadline that is coming up um, on November 15th of this year. We, well, we have two technical assessment programs as well. Next slide, please. We offer two technical assessment programs. Um, our technical assistance programs are designed to help small and medium-sized museums build capacity. There is MAP, and this is to build the capacity of museum operations and CAP 
helps to build capacity and collections care. Both of these programs are administered for IMLS by nonprofit organizations, and they're both excellent. They do excellent work. I encourage you to visit their websites and contact them with any additional questions. Okay, next slide, please. Museums for America and Inspire are very similar programs designed to strengthen museums and serving their public through their core function of museums, learning, community engagement, and collection stewardship. Inspire is designed specifically for small museums, has no cost share requirements, and has a grant ceiling of $50,000. Museums for America is available to all size museums, does require a one-to-one -one cost share, and has a ceiling of $250,000. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, Museums Empowered supports professional development that cuts across several departments um, in museums with a focus on generating systemic change. We welcome projects that address the needs of digital technology, diversity and inclusion, evaluation, and organizational management. The ceiling for this program is $250,000, and there is a one-to-one -one cost share requirement. And the National Leadership Grants for Museums is very similar to the National Leadership Grants for Libraries that I just went over very quickly. Um, these are often collaborations taking care of a big problem whose resolution will have a wide-ranging benefit and utility to the museum field and ultimately to the public that they serve. We fund research, non-research, rapid prototyping projects through this program. Um, and there are a variety of different ceilings um, of, of grant amounts that we give to this project and project durations. So I would advise that if you're interested in any of these programs to please look um, them up on our website. And then the last two programs in the Office of Museum Services are our Museum Grants for African American History and Culture that build capacity to support the growth and development of museum professionals at African American museums and HBCUs. There are two funding levels for the program. One is up to $50,000 with no cost share, and one is up to $250,000 with a one-to-one -one cost share required. We also offer a Native American, Native Hawaiian Museum Services Grant Program um, that supports Indian tribes and nonprofit organizations that primarily service Native Hawaiians um, and, and sustaining heritage, culture, and knowledge. These activities can include projects that are wide ranging, and we, the projects go up to $150,000, and there is no cost share. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I, I'm hoping that was enough to allow people to kind of glance at our programs and, and hopefully a couple have caught your attention. Um, and now I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail that you have heard from both NEA and NEH. It's very important to start early with your application to make sure you have a DUNS number, a SAM registration, and a grant stock of registration. These are three systems you need to register for in order to apply for the programs. They need to be active and current. Okay, next slide, please. And there is also a change that's kind of coming down the pike um, that the DUNS number will ultimately in April 2022 be replaced by a UE. It's called a unique entity identifier. Um, and you can read more about that on the grant stock of website. It's nothing to be concerned about, but it will be happening. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the best advice I can give you today is to go to our website and hopefully it's, you know, exploreimls.gov. It is the most authoritative and up-to-date source of information about everything we do in all of our programs. So you can check out the programs, education, um, eligibility criteria, look at sample applications. You could search our awarded grants to help you make good choices um, about the opportunities and which ones you should pursue. Next slide, please. And the key to every application effort is the notice of funding offer opportunity. We call it a NOFO. And the NOFO describes the program thoroughly. It details eligibility requirements. Um, and all of the details that you need to know about applying for the program. 
um, I want to make sure that this is a screenshot of where you can go and get to them on our website. Next slide, please. And once again, we just provide a variety of information on our website. These are links to well, this, um, the, the PowerPoint deck will be offered to you and you can go and link to all the, um, these links um, and, and get to the resources on our website pretty quickly. And we also have a PDF of all IMLS publications relating to museum and library relevant research, blogs by our grantees and staff, and information about our policy work and partnerships. Okay. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna very, very briefly touch on our peer review process. All of our applications are reviewed by your peers professionals who, who know the needs of museum and library communities. Um, it depends upon the program as to the type of review that we have. It's either one or two um, tier reviews. And all of our reviewer applications, um, our reviewer feedback rather, is sent back to you automatically with, uh, with the feedback that we give to you, whether you have received an award or if unfortunately you haven't received an award. So we do give all of our peer review feedback and we would encourage you to become a reviewer. You can go to our website and, um, and sign up and we are happy to have, have you be considered for reviewing this coming year. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, once again, some of the best advice, start early. Make sure that you look at all the programs and pick the one that is appropriate for you um, and that you are eligible for. And feel free to call program staff. We are here to help you go and answer any of your questions. Okay, next slide, please. And once again, here are some of the best advice. We ask you to, um, we think that these are, are, are really good tips for you that we have uh, collected along the way over the years um, and make sure that you, of course, review your narrative, make sure your budget matches um, everything that you have in your budget and in your application and check everything multiple times and apply early to make sure that your application comes through. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, once again, if it's one thing that I'd love to go and share with you today, please go to our website at imls.gov. We have information about staff members who can be contacted for every single one of our program programs and make sure to contact them too if you have any questions. Okay, next slide. Um, you can go and subscribe for our news releases, our newsletters, our blogs, it's all on our website. Okay, next slide. And this is my contact information. Um, I would be more than happy to go and answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. You were very clear. I just wish we had more time. Um, I uh, know we want to go to the Ohio History Connection now, but I wanted to say as I'm listening to this and looking at the people in the room here who have all stayed and uh, those on the uh, internet, I'm struck by a lot of information being presented and the load that some people may feel and is this really worth proceeding? I wanna present some information to those listening, uh, including our special guests. If you were to arrange every congressional district in the country by median household income, and we will send you, all of our presenters, we will send you this list you will see how America arrays itself. And in Ohio, we rank in the bottom quarter. And some of us, like my congressional district that stretches from where we are sitting to the center part of Cleveland, we rank 418 out of 435. When you rank in that place in the United States, that means you have fewer staff. That means that your local systems are all pressed. And uh, for example, I've been thinking about how do I form a team that can help my local people apply? Because their staffs are thin, 
and they operate at the edge many times. And I look at how worthy their work is. And so as I listen to this, I'm not sure I have an answer, but I'm wondering if each of the library systems I represent could create a core of people. And I'm offering this as a challenge. You know, you don't have to do this, but imagine if we had a grant center at the Toledo Lucas County Library uh, um, headquarters, and we did the same in Cleveland and the same in Lorraine, and the same in Sandusky, uh, where we, and maybe in Port Clinton too, and we look across the region and say, how can we, how can we make it easier for you to apply? How can we, can we apply for a grant to empower our libraries to do a better job? I don't know. This isn't really their job, but I know the coaching that's necessary to apply. And um, so I'm just throwing that out, uh, including to those who are listening, because I want to make it easier for you to deal with this, you know, 20 layer cake. And it's, um, it requires a lot of discipline and staffing as you're just trying to keep the doors open, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, but, but in general, I would say that those in the bottom quarter, and I have no figures for this, of the country probably receive less because they simply don't ask or don't have the ability to apply for a variety of reasons. So um, there is disparity that exists just based on where you come from. So I wanted to put that out there as a problem as I listen today. Uh, and a problem set that I think we can solve. Maybe we have to go to 10 of our foundations and say, would you match something that we could put at our libraries where we can create computer capability and application capability and help our people be successful for heaven's sake. And uh, uh, it is a um, uh, very, very um, appealing set of possibilities, but I can see some speed bumps along the way. Um, we want to conclude with the Ohio History Connection with Andy Verhoff, who is the Ohio History Fund and Outreach Manager for the State Historic Preservation Office. He's with us in person. And then Adam Eltrich, the Grants Manager of the State Historic Preservation Office. I'm going to have Margaret, uh, McGin uh, Margaret uh, McGinnis take the microphone from me because I have to go to another uh, event right now. And I'm so anxious to hear the questions as well. And uh, Margaret, I'll put you in charge here. And I, I want to for traveling such a distance to be with us and all those who have uh, come and participated and all those who are listening. I know there are dozens out there and we really want to help you and uh, with these organizations that are so critical to our future. And um, so help me help you. Help me find a way through. And those who are listening uh, from these important agencies, maybe you can advise me what to do uh, when um, our universities apply for grants, but maybe it's just for the university. But we're talking about community. We're talking about building strength in places where we need to do that, strength and understanding. So uh, Margaret, take over and thank you so very much and David Zavak for making today possible. Thank you, ma'am. Andy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, I'm Andy Veroff from the Ohio History Connection and with me, hi Adam, is Adam Eltrich. He's gonna be speaking next. Um, you are gonna witness a historic event and that historic event is me going through my slide deck in less than five minutes. You can write this down. You can tell your children. Um, you're timing me. Okay, good. Well, I run a program called the Ohio History Fund, and it funds uh, history projects. It funds history projects at a variety of different organizations. Of course, local historical societies and museums. Um, we fund uh, historic preservation projects. We fund... Uh, programs at art museums, uh, as long as it's history. Can't be performing arts or visual arts or something like that. And that's one project we funded right across the street here at the Libby House. We helped, uh, we helped, we did not do it entirely. There was a matching requirement, but we helped to make possible uh, the first Florida house to be handicapped or ADA accessible with a ramp and uh, accessible bathroom. I'll just have you, I'll just say next. Next. All right, our, our program is a little bit different than the ones you've heard about today. It is donated, it is funded by donations, pretty much. Uh, there's a tax checkoff on your state income tax form, line 26 called the Ohio History Fund. You can donate a part of your state income tax return uh, to the Ohio History Fund. The average donation is nine or 10 bucks. So, uh, you know, we're not talking 
entire amounts. We also have a license plate. If you look out in a car in the parking lot, you'll see my car with one of these license plates. Uh, the BMV gets $10, we get 20. It goes towards our grant program. And then if you don't like mastodons, and who doesn't like mastodons? But there are a few. Or if you don't get a state income tax uh, refund, you can just give directly the Ohio History Connection for the History Fund. This is where most of the money comes from. About 85% of the money we give out Oh, comes from the tax checkoff. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll tell you what. Um, uh, Margaret uh, was kind enough to see that these get, uh, these got printed off. Thank you. Um, so actually that has my presentation on it. Plus you'll get the slide deck. So you already have some of this information, but what do we fund? We fund history projects uh, by organizations in the state of Ohio. Uh, we also fund history projects at local government agencies and public libraries and university archives. Uh, that is not an exclusive list. That's sort of a, 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 a including but not limited to sort of list. We also fund projects uh, that are part of our site management system, but we won't pay for anything we already pay for through our regular appropriation process. Uh, ineligible applicants, like so many other uh, programs you heard about today are for-profit businesses, private individuals, and of course, the Ohio History Connections. We can't give grants to ourselves. A little conflict of interest there. And then if you want to see who got money, go to our website, which is on the slides. Next. <sighs> so three broad categories of things we fund. Programs and collections, I kind of call that colloquially our soup, and soup, uh, soup to nuts category oral history projects, museum exhibits, walking tours, collections management projects at museums, uh, digitization, apps, kind of a little bit of everything. Uh, bricks and mortar, uh, that's building, historic building renovation. The building must be on the National Register or recognized and protected by a local historic preservation ordinance. And then thirdly, organizational development. So that would be things like strategic planning, needs assessments, uh, we sort of summarize that organizational development category as uh, helping organizations help themselves, grants so they can do that. Um, and then um, what can you request? Our grants, honestly, they're small, you know, compared to, uh, compared to IMLS or NEH or NEA, they're small, between $1,000 and $20,000. So no, you're not going to put an elevator in your museum with 20 grand, but it might help with one part of the project. And that's what a lot of uh, applicants do. We do require a match between 20 to 40 percent of the total project cost. And then uh, match, we define that very broadly. That could be cash money, that could be donated goods and materials, it can be volunteer time, monetized of course, it could be staff time. So uh, we define that very broadly as I say. Next, the application deadline. We got one going on right now. The deadline is September the 28th. Uh, at 11.59 p.m. Uh, I get that question a lot as we get closer to the deadline, but anyway. Um, and, um, and you find out if you got a grant in mid-February. We have a very extensive review process. Next, that's how to get a hold of me, which is in your information. And Adam, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Eltridge to talk about some of the grant programs uh, available through the Historic Preservation Office. Um, and Adam Eltridge is our grant manager. Adam, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name, again, is Adam Eltrich. I'm actually a native son of Lorraine, so uh, grew up right off of Oak Point Road, and uh, so this is very exciting for me to uh, be a part of. Um, I'm just going to touch base real quick about uh, the two main grant programs that uh, I oversee, and then um, there's also a should be, I emailed to Margaret a handout that oversees um, the other grant programs that are through the National Park Service that we help run. But um, the first one I'm gonna start off with is called the, the Ohio uh, Historic Preservation Tax Credit Grant uh, Pipeline Grant Program. And this is actually a uh, state level grant uh, program, which um, is for creating a pipeline of buildings and districts uh, in Ohio that eventually can utilize the um, tax credit program for uh, rehab and revitalization. Uh, just so for a quick example, um, last year, the city of Lorraine 
uh, received a uh, tax credit grant for $12,000 to uh, establish the first uh, historic district in the city of Lorraine, but it's all, it's the Broadway historic district. So uh, should be by the end of the year uh, heard by our uh, board and be to on the national register of historic places uh, sometime next year. So um, the grant uh, ranges from uh, 4,000 to 12,000. So typically uh, an individual building will receive $4,000 and a district pro project will receive uh, $12,000. Uh, and uh, it's all reimbursement. So it's uh, once uh, the uh, project is paid for th from the consultant, once the consultant is paid, we will then reimburse after the state board has heard the, um, the listing to be heard on the national register. So um, that is our the one grant I oversee. And then uh, the second grant I oversee is called the Certified Local Government, the CLG grant program. And that is a uh, program through the National Park Service that is uh, funneled down to our office. So 10% uh, of the annual appropriation um, for the state preservation office is set aside for CLG grants. So um, approximately $130,000 each year is available. Uh, one big stipulation is that you have to be a certified local government to apply to these grants, uh, but there's no requirements on size or um, population. It's just going through the requirements um, through your local ordinances to become a certified local government. So, um, so the, again, a variety of different types of projects for historic preservation are used in this uh, program. Uh, again, what's really nice because this is a federal program, uh, both the, this grant and the state grant that I just talked about the pipeline can be utilized for uh, the same project. So city of Lorraine actually re got their historic district project done pretty much for free because they used both of these grants. So it's a great opportunity to piggyback on state money and federal money. Um, other projects are, uh, for example, are uh, historic guidelines for a city. If you have a historic district, you wanna make sure that the gui there's guidelines uh, to ensure uh, you know, citizens are uh, taking care of their buildings, their homes and the buildings properly. That can be applied or funded by this grant. Um, conduct workshops for homeowners in your historic district and contractors. Um, you know, there's a uh, also do a main or big projects for, um, uh, for example, for development. Uh, so uh, in Lorraine, uh, First Church in Oberlin utilize utilize the grant program a lot to. Uh, do major maintenance and repairs and projects on the church itself. So um, it's, a, uh, it's a great program. And um, right now we will be opening the grant application for, for the CLG uh, most in November. It closes in February. And uh, it's a two-year window to two-year fiscal, uh, federal fiscal year to uh, complete the project. So um, backtracking a little bit, the pipeline applications are always available. They're always being accepted. It's just about the money where uh, the money being used up uh, through the year. So um, there isn't a deadline to apply to that grant. It's always, they're always accepting applications. So um, the, um, and then the, some of the other federal grants that I could just run through real quick that we kind of help oversee, uh, won't get into too many details, but the African American Civil Rights Grant is a, is a competitive grant that will document, interpret, and preserve the sites and stories related to African American struggle to gain equal rights as citizens. Again, that's through the National Park Service, but it's through our office. Um, Another highlight one is a newer grant we, we just received. It's called the Paul Brune Historic Revitalization Grants Program. 
This was formerly known as the uh, Historic Revitalization Subgrant Program, and it is designed to support the rehab of historic properties in, in rural communities uh, defined as having a population on under 40,000. Uh, and also another grant program is called Save America's Treasures, and it's a brick and mortars preservation uh, program for uh, preserving nationally significant intellectual and cultural artifacts and historic structures and sites. So um, again, most of these other grants are on are through the National Park Service, but as I said, we uh, in the State Historic Preservation Office uh, help oversee them. So uh, that's all I had to say for right now. And uh, I will give it up to you, Margaret. Thank you, Adam. And thank you everyone who's here in person. Think of your questions just a moment before we turn over. Um, I do want to, since NEA was so kind to send Wendy in person, I would just like to unmute Diane Dewhurst to say a few words. Um, a dear colleague of the Congresswoman, she used to serve in Speaker Pelosi's office. She would like to say hello, and then we will turn to questions. Any questions that um, come in through the chat, we will be monitoring and make sure that those are answered as well. So Diane, you are unmuted. I will be very quick. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you to the staff of Congresswoman Kaptur for, her, for their work in putting this together. And thank you, Wendy, for your travels. I just wanted you to know and to reassure you that you have a powerful and persistent voice in Washington. Um, I had the great fortune to work with the Congresswoman uh, for over 15 years. Um, I consider her a friend and I consider her an advocate for the heartland. There was not a day that went by that she did not argue powerfully, persistently, persuasively for her constituents and telling us all about her region of Ohio. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, Margaret, I hope you'll pass my very best on to the Congresswoman, and I look forward to seeing her soon. And thank you all for all that you're doing. We look forward to working with you uh, uh, from the NEA. Thanks very much, Margaret. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Diane. We certainly will pass that along. Is there any questions here in person that anyone would like to ask, maybe in particular for Wendy from NEA who's here, or we also still have NEH, IMLS, and Ohio History Connection? Yes, I will come over to you, ma'am. Okay, for the, um, I did catch the grant deadline for the projects, but not for the uh, ARP funds. August 12th is the deadline for part one for the American Recovery Plan. And then for part two, which is when you upload more, a uh, few more materials, it depends on your organization's last name. If, if it's A through L, it is August 19th through the 25th. And if it's M through Z, it's the 20, August 27th through September 2nd. Great, thank you. Any other questions in person? No, okay. Well, we are going to conclude the event. We will be in, looking in the chat for any questions that came in via there, and we will route those to the appropriate agencies. Thank you so much for everyone's participation. Have a safe summer. Thank you.